Well, Kendall, Kendall's evening book group is going to have a discussion on uh, the, this book on the indomitable Florence Finch a week from Monday night. And uh, we have probably about 12 regulars in that book group, but I'm extending the invitation to the book group to anybody I know who is from First Press who might be interested in that. And I'm going to take copious notes today because I'm leading the discussions. Uh -huh. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, Florence was in a Bible study when I retired from interiming and I had to be in a small group. So I joined the Bible study. And over the years, we heard a lot of Florence's stories. Um, they were wonderful. And it was just a real privilege to, to hear them and to get to know her. Um, so a lot of these stories are familiar, but the book says a whale of a lot more than what we heard. Yeah. I'm sure. She was a very quiet person. Mm -hmm. But, and I, if you have, I know people don't like Amazon, but I got mine in two days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, they don't like their um, labor policy. What happened? You know, it's unfortunate that. Uh, all of these companies have become so huge, not just Amazon and Google and Facebook and all that. I mean, I was just listening to a news report saying that, yeah, a lot of people will avoid Amazon, but if you do Netflix, you're using Amazon. If you're doing other things, you're using Amazon. I mean, it's such a conglomerate, you know. Yeah. Wow. And we're not That's and also uh, the Washington Post. Really? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Jeff, Bezos. Jeff Bales, he owns the Washington Post. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Isn't he the richest man in the world? No. Yes. No. Yes, Ooh. I believe so. <laughs> uh, somebody else I thought had supplanted him. Yeah. <laughs> that guy in Mexico City? No. Uh, I don't remember who. Yeah. Yeah. Bezos, the Amazon owner. Oh. He's supposed to be the richest. Interestingly, man. his ex wife is giving away guns, money to all kinds of, for instance, um, uh, black colleges and uh, a lot of different people who don't have resources. Yeah. And he's just delighting and uh, researching and um, sharing the money that she got out of that marriage. <laughs> there was a really amazing statistic that um, I saw online and enjoyed. Um, if you uh, work full time from the birth of Christ to now, and earned $2,000 per hour and never spent one dime of it, um, you still wouldn't have nearly as much money as the most wealthy people in the world. Wow. Good grief. That's a lot of money. <laughs> well, it's nice when it's they kind of play. obscene. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely obscene. It's nice when Not they right. give it away. Ali, where are you coming from? Are you joining us from another place? Okay. Hi, Roy. Good morning, Roy. Oh, he's muted. You may get muted. I don't know. No. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Do we have any idea when the author is going to be joining us? At what time? Um, I had an email this morning and said 11 05. <laughs> okay. 11 05. It, it would be, uh, no, not yet. Um, yeah, it's hard to. Sometimes our services go until 11. Uh, today we ended at um, about 
Okay, so sometimes we go until 11. So, uh, we told the author to join us uh, 11.05, 11.10. So hopefully he'll be, I, I keep monitoring the participants. He hasn't joined yet. While we're waiting. Um, it would be thank, helpful. While we're waiting, I wanted to thank It would be helpful uh, to uh, join uh, us if everyone could mute themselves. There's an awful lot of static and background uh, it may sound inconsequential to you in your own home, but it's coming over the mics pretty loudly. So um, it makes it hard for other people to hear. <clears throat> While we're waiting, can you hear me now? I think I'm unmuted. Uh, I want to thank I want to thank Kerry for the, um, the excellent announcements, uh, not only of this week but also next week. Uh, when we're going to have Sarah Hess with us, uh, she'll be talking about um, not only the Green New Deal um, for Ithaca, but also the housing boom in Ithaca and how the new building code and that new housing boom are interacting and what effect it's having on it. So uh, I think you'll all find it interesting. Uh, so if you can be here next week, there's the plug. Thank you, Kiri. Yeah, to uh, carry on for the plugs. I just saw somebody join. No, not yet. He's not here yet. Lorraine, can you hear me? This is Susan. Yes, I can. Um, while we're waiting for the author's arrival, I'd be glad to read uh, four short paragraphs from the prologue of the book, which is brilliant. Does anybody want to use the time that way? Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, this is written in October of 1944. At 29, Florence Smith knew the depth of terror as well as she knew her own family, at least those who were still alive. She had lived with fear every day for more than three years. That would be since Pearl Harbor. Two of her closest contacts in the Philippines underground had recently disappeared. She could only assume they'd been taken out by the Kempaitai and were being tortured to find out who had stolen the Japanese army's stocks of gasoline and diesel fuel and diverted them to the Philippine resistance. <laughs> the Kempaitai officer had the unlimited power to uh, arrest, torture, <laughs> condemn without trial or execute anyone in the Philippines. I see Joy nodding because she knows all this. Florence <laughs> hoped her friends had not revealed her role in the diversions. A month earlier, the Kempaitai sent two officers to question Florence and her co-workers at the Philippine Liquid Fuel Distribution Union. Afterward, the Japanese director of the company brought the staff together to say the Kempaitai was sure that people in the company were guilty of sabotage and stealing massive quantities of liquid mm -hmm. fuel. The punishment for the criminals would be death. Mm -hmm. Steer clear of trouble, Osawa warned them. The time will come when you will be glad you followed my advice. Lawrence had not followed his advice. They came for her shortly after dawn. Now, if that doesn't whet your appetite to read the book, <laughs> I think nothing will. Uh, thank, thank you, Susan. Um, Carolyn. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, do you know when Robert will be joining us? Let me go downstairs. I'm his wife, and I... I was trying to be his technical guru here, so he said he'll be fine, but he's not, so I'm gonna go in his office. I apologize. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was totally amazed at the amount of research, that bibliography and, and thing of references at the end just went on for pages. It was incredible. They can't see you. Oh, there you are. Yes, we can. Okay. 
<laughs> Hello. Good morning. All right. Here, I'll say, I'm going to go back in my office. You need okay. water? Very good. Okay. Yeah, I got water. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Okay. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we just heard, I think, uh, one of our members just read the um, introduction to the book. So that uh, many of us have read the book, although all of us haven't gotten it yet. But just about everyone on Zoom this morning uh, knew Florence. Uh, some of us perhaps knew her better than others, but we did not know all that's revealed in your book. So thank you so much for, for bringing that to all of us. So well, I it was an exciting opportunity. It was a privilege to be able to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe you could tell us perhaps what brought you to uh, want to tell that story, a uh, little bit about how you came to write the book, and then perhaps we can open it up for questions and discussions from, from everyone else. So thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Well, you know, we live in a time <laughs> where celebrities are celebrated for becoming celebrities without ever having achieved anything of substance. And one of the most remarkable things about Florence, Ebersole, Smith, uh, Finch, is that she never told anybody what she had done, including her own children, Bobby and, and Betty, uh, that she had earned the Medal of Freedom from President Harry Truman, that she had saved hundreds of lives, hundreds of lives, of Americans and Filipino underground members during the Second World War. And it wasn't until 1995 uh, when the US Coast Guard notified Florence that uh, they were going to be naming their new Pacific headquarters building after her, that her children, Bobby and Betty, found out that she'd been married before about everything she had done during the war. There was a, a deepness of humility about Betty that I think is as profound uh, as with any human being I've ever learned about. Um, and I often wondered whether I might have I might have met Florence uh, when I was a student at Cornell University in ancient times. Uh, I was there between 1963 and 1967. And I was a government major, and Florence was then working for Professor George Cahan in the Far East Studies Department. And I did take a course there, and I uh, sometimes wonder if our paths might have crossed then. But uh, if they did, I was too wooden-headed to recognize the quality of, of Florence. Uh, and. I, I learned about the story in an interesting way. I think it's an interesting way. Uh, back in 2013, I wrote and co-directed a feature film called The Congressman, uh, which I thought was, although I, I had a full head of hair when I started on that project, it was as stressful as anything I've ever done in my life. But it was, it, it was a worthy film. And one of the creative producers on the film was a man who had read the script and, and really liked it. And his name is Fred Roos, R-O-O-S. And Fred uh, produced all of Francis Ford Coppola's films. If you remember the Godfather films and Apocalypse Now and <clears throat> dozens of others. Fred was the producer of all of those films. He won two Academy Awards. Um, in, in the spring of 2017, I was in Manhattan in New York City and working on another project. And Fred was back in New York for what they were calling the Godfather reunion, where Francis Coppola and Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, James Caan, and many others um, we're gathering in New York City to, to celebrate one of the anniversaries of the film. And we, he and I got together for a drink at his hotel. And when I first arrived, the first thing he did was hand me a copy of the New York Times. And he said, 
did you read this obituary about this incredible woman? And I looked at it and I wouldn't, I, I hadn't read it and I wouldn't have read it because I was traveling and and he said, you know, I spent two years in the Philippines making Apocalypse Now. And it was an incredible experience. And I love the people. I love the country. This is an amazing story. And the woman came from Ithaca, New York, where I was living. He said, go get that story. <laughs> and I came back to Ithaca and I found Betty's number on in the phone book. And I... I I called and left a message and um, one thing led to another and we got together and it turned out that her brother Bobby had run, read one of my previous World War II nonfiction books. And uh, as I recall, he said something to the effect if, if he can tell the story of mom the way he did the men in that torpedo squadron in the World War II book, he's probably the right person to research and write the story. And that's how I got involved with it. And it turned out to be, now, listen, I'm an ex-politician. I was a member of Congress for 10 years. Lord knows we politicians are capable of exaggeration at times, but this is truly the most remarkable story I've ever had a chance to write. And I've written 11 books since I left Congress in 1993. Um, let me give you a little background into the setting for the story. Um, in 1941, in December, of course, the Japanese attacked our base at Pearl Harbor. And uh, within 12 hours, they began attacking American military installations in the Philippines. And that led to the invasion a month later by the Japanese of the Philippines and uh, their conquering of the American army and the American Philippine army that was led by General Douglas MacArthur. And for the next four years, uh, the Japanese occupying authority controlled the Philippines. Florence was living in the Philippines at the time. She had been born there. I think one of the, the biggest challenges I faced in telling her story was when I asked Bobby and Betty, you know, what, what her early life was like. And, and Bob said to me, well, she doesn't remember or didn't remember anything before she went to the Union uh, Church Hall School in Manila at the age of seven. And it struck me that there had to be memories that preceded her going off to school at the age of seven, um, but Bobby and Betty didn't, didn't know them. The first memory that Florence said uh, she remembered to Bobby when he was taping her in 2008 was I can remember being in a jungle or a forest and hiding and my mother's voice shouting, Loring, Loring, Loring. You see Florence's original name, her birth name was Loring May Ebersole. Well, thankfully, uh, I was able to learn uh, through research about her early life. Um, and it's important for you to know how that started because it's almost Dickensian in its complexity and its trauma on her life. Her father uh, was named Charles Ebersol, and he came from Buffalo, New York. And at the age of 17, he volunteered for the U.S. Army after reading about uh, the adventures of Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders going up San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War not only entailed Cuba, it entailed the, the Spanish-owned possession of the Philippines, which they had controlled for almost 600 years. So Charlie Ebersole became a medic in the army and he went over to the Philippines and he arrived there at a time when the war had really heated up. 
when the Spanish were defeated uh, by the United States um, in the Battle of Manila Bay, uh, the Philippine independence advocates were hoping that they would be released, that the Philippines would become an independent nation. But the United States decided to make it their, our occupation, if you will. And Emilio Aguinaldo, who led the Philippine independence movement, decided to uh, create an insurrection against the United States, which led to, the, to our involvement in the Spanish-American War to put down the Philippine insurrection. At the time Charlie Ebersole arrived there as a medic to work in the hospital, the, uh, the war had become very savage. There were atrocities on both sides, more on the American side committing atrocities than the Philippine side. But the war coarsened Charlie, and when it ended in 1902, uh, he decided to stay behind. He did not want to go back to Buffalo <laughs> and our upstate winters here. Uh, and he decided to stay in the Philippines. He went to work for a contractor that was building roads and hospitals and schools in Northern Luzon. <clears throat> and he was very good at his work. He began banking a lot of money. Uh, he bought a, a small plantation on the Kalau River uh, in Isabella province. And at that time he fell in love with a young woman who was 24 years old named Maria Hermoso. Uh, the only problem in the relationship was that Maria was already married. She was married to a former uh, Spanish soldier during the Spanish-American War, and they had a, a, a toddler, a small child named Flaviana, a daughter. And Charlie, with a kind of reptilian cold-bloodedness, decided to break up that marriage and asked her to go with him, which she did, Maria did. And they moved to the plantation and over the years, Charlie built it into a very successful, abundant plantation along the river. It ran almost a mile on both sides of that river. Very beautiful country. He and Maria began to have children and their fourth child was Loring May, who became Florence. And um, she was born in, in, in 1915. And her earliest years were, 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 were peaceful and loving. But in 1922, uh, Flaviana had, became, had become a beautiful young woman. This was this was uh, Maria's child with Marcel Artsy, the Spanish soldier. She was a, a younger, more beautiful uh, version of her mother. Um, Maria was illiterate. She spoke Tagalog. She did not learn to speak uh, or more than pidgin English, if that's the term, or write English. Uh, Maria was brought up by Charlie, who believed very much in education and reading. So she was literate and very compelling. She fell in love with a Filipino named Antonio Vasquez and they were, uh, they were married. Um, but three months after the marriage, Charlie rode to their village on horseback and said to Flaviana, I want you to become my wife. Oh my word. And she agreed. Uh, I've often wondered why, there are probably a number of reasons, but I won't go into that at the moment. And he brought her back to the plantation and told Maria she could stay with her, their children. Uh, but in the original house on the plantation, small house, he had by then with Maria built a, a very substantial plantation house later on occupied by the Japanese during the war. And, and that led to a situation which you can imagine was incredibly challenging and difficult, particularly for Maria, who became increasingly sullen, withdrawn, 
turned inward and at a certain point began taking it out on the children, uh, which I go to, uh, into in some detail in the book. It was at that time that Charlie intervened and said to both Norma, uh, Florence's older sister, and to Florence, then known as Lauren, that she was sending them to a school. It was called the Union Church Hall School in Manila. And it was a new school for Mestiza children. Those are uh, half Filipino and half American, Mestiza girls. And that is when Florence left the plantation, never to return. And from the age of seven, was essentially on her own uh, under the auspices of the Union Church Hall School. Uh, I just, I, I went into a lot of detail on that simply because it was what formed her. It is what led to her becoming strong and independent. As she lived for the next 10 years at, at the school, uh, which was founded on the Protestant ethic of faith and duty and hard work, and where she flourished as a student, perhaps the best student in the school. And upon graduation, uh, went to business college and then took a job uh, at the Army and Navy YMCA, which was a huge complex serving all of the American military in the Pacific, who, as they came to Manila in the Philippines, would stay at, there were hundreds of rooms there, there were entertainment rooms, there were restaurants, there were uh, sporting facilities. And she went to work for a man named H.J. Schofield, who fell in love with her, as many, <laughs> many men did. She was a lovely young woman. Uh, and she became the de facto manager of the uh, Army Navy YMCA in Manila. And as the war approached and the, the Japanese had invaded China uh, just to the north of the Philippines, and as the war clouds began uh, arriving over the Philippines and the world as a, at large, uh, she met uh, a young man named Bing Smith. His name, his real name was Charles Smith. They called him Bing because he had an uncanny resemblance to the crooner, Bing Crosby, a oh. better looking version and bigger. He was 6'2". He was the star pitcher on the Pacific All Fleet baseball team. Uh, he was a, a man's man, a leader, a natural leader. And he was working for Naval Intelligence in Manila. And I think it's important for telling the story of, of Florence, for you to know that there were two men during the war, before and during the war, who were very important to her life. The first was Charles Smith, Bing Smith, who she fell in love with. And at that point, um, Bing Smith discovered that another guy across the hall from, from him at the uh, military headquarters was a man named Carl Engelhart, and he was the head of army intelligence uh, for the Philippine army, uh, for the American army in the Philippines. And, and Bing Smith got, an inter got Florence, who was looking to do something more responsible as the war appeared to be coming closer. She met and interviewed with Carl Engelhart to join him in the office of army intelligence uh, for the Philippines. Um, and she went to work for Carl Engelhart and he became her mentor. He was a Lieutenant Colonel. He was a brilliant intelligence officer. He spoke fluent Japanese. He had spent three years in, um, uh, in Tokyo as a military attache where he learned fluent Japanese, <clears throat> which enabled him to to learn Japanese military culture and make a number of intelligence breakthroughs as the war approached. Uh, he was working with a British agent 
and delivering information back to Washington and also to uh, British intelligence in London, uh, which led to Winston Churchill uh, writing a compliment to Engelhardt for uh, some, of, some of the intelligence he was developing about Japanese intentions. Engelhardt knew the Japanese were planning to invade. He made a serious attempt to convince General Douglas MacArthur that an invasion was imminent, but his um, analyses were ignored. And when the Japanese invaded, uh, it came as an incredible shock uh, to MacArthur. It led to some terrible decisions being made that led to the fall of the US Army in the Philippines. Uh, Bing Smith left uh, Manila after the Japanese invasion, went to Corregidor, the fortress of Corregidor, and from there was working with Carl Engelhardt uh, in leadership positions uh, to try to stem the Japanese advance. Uh, Bing was, was killed off Bataan uh, in a PT boat, uh, he earned the Distinguished Service Cross, saving a fellow crewman, the DSC being the second highest award for valor to the Congressional Medal of Honor. And chances are Florence would not have learned about his death, his valiant death, uh, until well into the war, maybe the end of the war, except for the fact that when MacArthur bestowed posthumously uh, the, the Distinguished Cross, Service Cross on Bing Smith, um, Carl Engelhardt got the copy of the citation for, um, for how he earned it. And when, the, when, when Corregidor fell, after Bataan fell and the, and the death march took place, uh, the Bataan death, the famous Bataan death march, in which seventy thousand American and Philippine soldiers were marched seventy miles uh, to prison camps. Ten thousand died along the way. <clears throat> Shortly after Bataan fell, Corregidor fell, and because Carl Engelhardt spoke fluent Japanese and was one of the very few American officers who did. Um, he encountered a Japanese prince who was a lieutenant in, at Royal, he was in the royal family in Japan, related to the emperor. And he was very impressed with, with Carl Engelhardt, as were other Japanese. And he said, is there anything I can do for you? Because Carl was going to be going into the same prison camps of all of the Americans uh, who had survived the Bataan Death March. And he said, could you do me a favor? Could you give this citation to a, a young woman who worked for me and who will otherwise never know what happened to her husband? And the next day, this Japanese officer appeared at the home that Florence shared with Bing Smith and, and gave her the citation and was how she learned about the death of her husband. And it was what led to Florence in her sorrow and her anger over Bing's loss that led to her undertaking the very high risk steps that she did, which led to her receiving the Medal of Honor. Uh, it was then that she got a job working for the Philippine Liquid uh, Fuel Union, which supplied all the fuel to the Japanese military, and whatever was left over was rationed uh, to, the, to the Philippine people. And it was when she was reading a newsletter one day, after she had had the job, uh, she, was, she was hired to fill out the warehouse receipts and the order forms from Filipinos who were looking to acquire some of the rationed gas, diesel fuel, kerosene, and so forth 
she would fill, she had very good handwriting and she would fill out those forms uh, for those who were allowed to receive some of the liquid fuel. And it was months after she had the job, she was reading a newsletter about uh, men who had forged coupons to get some of the gasoline. And it was then that she realized that she could falsify some of these coupons and warehouse receipts and begin shifting some of this gasoline to the underground. Uh, by then, uh, the, the Japanese people were suffering terribly under, under the Japanese rule. And by then she had connected again with Carl Engelhart. There was an underground communication uh, uh, methodology in which they were smuggling notes from uh, Filipinos into the camp where the Americans were. And she smuggled a note into Carl Engelhart, who was at that point starving to death along with dozens of his friends. And she asked him, um, you know, how she could help. And he said, medicine, food, money, so that we can bribe the guards and save. By then, the, the Americans were dying by the hundreds every week, 500, 700, 1,000. They were being buried in mounds by the dozens near the camp. So that is when Florence began force falsifying these coupons and building a network of people um, who could sell the coupons on the black market, get the gasoline, get the diesel fuel, have that sold and have it converted for use to buy medicine and food and other things that saved those American lives. She did it for two and a half years under the eyes of the Japanese. There were 98 Japanese officers working at the Philippine Liquid Fuel Union. While she was doing this, uh, she was almost caught twice. In October of 1944, one of the people smuggling medicine into the camp, who was part of her network, was captured, tortured, and revealed Florence's role in, uh, in what she was doing. And she was arrested and brought to uh, the Kempatai headquarters. The Kempatai was the Japanese secret police. Uh, and there she was tortured in horrific ways. Uh, and she continued to refuse to tell the names of the people that she had worked with in the underground under horrific torture. And ultimately, when she had refused to do more than confess that she herself had been involved, she was sent to another camp uh, where, a political, where political prisoners were held and where they were being taken out and beheaded uh, as the war came to a, a close. And shortly before she was to be beheaded and she was one of the, the few prisoners left, the first cavalry division uh, arrived in Manila and released her along with the, the, the few remaining prisoners. And she weighed 77 pounds at that time from a weight of 120 and, and was close to dying of starvation but she was taken to uh, a hospital and regained her strength. And because she, her father was an American and she had been married to an American, a decorated American hero, she was given permission to come to the United States. And she left all alone uh, to come to America and travel across country to Buffalo, New York, where her family lived, where Charles Ebersole's family lived. And that was how she came to the United States. I'm sorry for taking so long to tell at least part of her story, but it's so 
remarkable to me <clears throat> what she endured, what she went through. Uh, and, and then decided because of her deep humility that she really wasn't a hero. It was those in her network who died fighting the Japanese who were the heroes. And it was only when she met Carl Engelhardt in Washington after the war uh, had ended and he learned about what she had done, which led to the investigation, which culminated in her being awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Truman. So that's basically, uh, again, what she accomplished during the war. We know what she accomplished. You know better than I what she accomplished in the church as a deacon of the church, as a mentor to younger members of the church, which was simply a continuation of what she did at Union Church Hall uh, as a mestiza, when the younger mestizas were faced with the same bigotry that Florence had been faced with by well-meaning Christians in Manila who looked at the mestizas as pitiable objects, tar babies, if you will. In fact, that was the name one of them had. And it was Florence who mentored the younger mestizos to strengthen them, to face the bigotry, to deal with it, to move on, to accomplish their goals. And she was always looking forward and always looking to, to, uh, to have those goals. I, I, I was contacted by somebody not long ago, who knew Florence at uh, the nursing home and who said, you know, up, right up toward the end, she was the go-to person for the staff when somebody was giving up on life. Florence would be sent in to talk to them about why life still needed to be cherished. Every day needed to be savored right up to the end. Just an amazing, amazing woman. And I'm so proud and appreciative of Betty and Bobby Finch to give me the chance to research and write her story. So with that, let me close my monologue. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Uh, it, it was a privilege. Thank you. Yes, th thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if people have questions. Um, Comments, you'll have to unmute yourself. I muted everyone. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, it took uh, a, lot, a lot less time than I thought it would. And that was because of the treasure trove that was maintained by, by Betty, her daughter, of all of her letters, because the letters were so uh, indelible, so informative, she started writing. When her father died in 1928, and incidentally, that is how I was able to learn about the early life. In 1930, two years after his death, a legal battle broke out over the ownership of his very substantial plantation. Uh, in Isabella province. The family of Maria on one side, the family of Flaviana on the other side. And the legal battle lasted 50 years uh, over who was going to get it. And so my researcher found about 80 pages of documents, including um, sworn affidavits by Maria and Flaviana and other children, which allowed me to to get a full understanding of what had occurred at that time. So that really short-circuited the research uh, for her early youth. When her father died in 1928, uh, Florence began a correspondence with her aunt Mabel in Buffalo, who had been in regular correspondence with Charlie, uh, which enabled me to learn about 
Charlie's life after Florence uh, went to Manila to go to school. And then Florence began that correspondence, detailed correspondence with Mabel, which went right up to the Japanese invasion uh, of the Philippines in, in December 41. Everybody who she wrote to saved her letters. And the letters ended up coming back to Florence and ended up being given to Betty, along with a lot of other documentation, which again enabled me to research and tell the story in about a year, which uh, was again a lot shorter period of time than I anticipated. But uh, it was so much fun. It was so much fun to go back and relive those times uh, in my imagination with her and also researching the story of Bing Smith and, and, and Carl Engelhart, who, who Betty stayed in close touch with until his death uh, in, in 1991. And we, we, we'd really like to thank you for writing this incredible book of um, our amazing Florence and her fortitude and incredible gifts she gave so many people. We're wondering, um, is a movie in the works? When can we see it on the big screen? Well, needless to say, I have a subjective opinion on that, but I think it would make an absolutely brilliant film or uh, a limited television series, because I don't think you can tell the complete story of the indomitable Florence Finch in an hour and a half. Um, so I started this by talking about Fred Roos. Now Fred is 84 years old, but still going strong. And he has taken the story out. He, he believes very strongly, number one, uh, it must be filmed in the Philippines. Number two, there ought to be uh, Philippine actress, actresses uh, who could play Florence, both as a young person and as a, a young woman. So I have put my faith in Fred, who, uh, as I've indicated, is a very accomplished filmmaker, has won two Academy Awards, he is he has taken out the book and a treatment of a limited television series to um, a number of people and now and this all has happened in the midst of the pandemic and a lot of things shut down out in la la land and within the film industry but i although i have hopes that perhaps i could be involved in writing uh, the story. Uh, at this point, we don't have any, uh, we're not close to a, a completion of, 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 a, of a film deal, if you will, or a television deal, but Fred is actively working on it. I have a I can ask a question. I have a question. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the book. Uh, I thought it was uh, masterfully put together in terms of structure and how you wove together the different, you know, individuals that were in Florence's life. Uh, I found it particularly interesting that you included the story of Kiyoshi Osawa. Um, and I wanted to get some idea of why you decided to include him and more about him. Um, yes, thank you, Sandra. I found Mr. Osawa to be a fascinating individual. Uh, he was a very proud Japanese. He had come to the Philippines uh, in the 1920s. He had become very successful. He understood the resentment that many Japanese had uh, in their being treated uh, by the British and the Americans as uh, not subhuman, but not in the class of the Caucasian, if you will. And so when the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor, uh, Mr. Osawa 
was very proud that they had unleashed this force on behalf of the emperor that would enable them to uh, spread the, what they called the greater uh, Asian co-prosperity sphere uh, across Asia. Uh, the Philippines, Malaya, Hong Kong, Singapore, Burma, and so forth. It was only after the Japanese had successfully invaded the Philippines and taken control that he began to see that they did not understand the typical Filipino, the pride that the Filipino had. Uh, they're, 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 they're being potentially a very good ally of Japan instead of people who should be subjugated by Japan. And, and watching his attitude begin to change, uh, and, and of course it was important, I thought, in telling the story for, for, for the rest of you, Mr. Osawa ran the Philippine Liquid Fuel Union under the control of the Japanese army. But he was the CEO, if you will, the chief executive officer of the company. And he liked Florence. And I found it very funny, he had, you know, when he first met Florence and interviewed her for a position, when she was leaving the office, he said to her, do you play, do you play badminton? <laughs> she, she was somewhat taken aback. She wasn't terribly athletic. And she said, no, I, I, I don't play. And he said, well, you're going to learn because sports and activities, this is a very stressful job. Uh, so, I, you know, seeing, seeing his change and ultimately at the end of the war, realizing that the Japanese had lost and why they had lost uh, was a very important transformation. And I was fortunate there because Mr. Osawa wrote four books about his own involvement in the Philippines during the war, including his administration of the Philippine Liquid uh, Fuel Union. And, uh, and it was just one more facet of her life that I thought was worth telling. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question uh, or maybe make a comment. Um, I've known quite a few Japanese, uh, Japanese Americans or people who have come from Japan, uh, usually in our church situation, and that's not a random sample. Um, but anyway, I've always been so delighted uh, to know them and found them to be such excellent people. And I I'm sure that, uh, that Florence would have been through her life uh, associating with people uh, that, like the ones that I have known. That is, once she came to the United States and in her mature years. Um, and I've just wondered how she could um, even relate to them. Uh, which I think she did, uh, knowing what Japanese had done to her. Um, and so uh, I just wonder if you, uh, I'd be glad that Osawa was uh, brought out as a humane person uh, in the book. But uh, reading the book, I would have, if I hadn't known other people who were from Japan, I would be really poisoned uh, against them, just knowing you know, what happened. Um, I have also known people from Korea who suffered under the Japanese. So I, I know these things all happened and were real. And thinking about my own history, my, my mother was German. And, and, and so, you know, I can think about how Germans uh, were, were uh, despised almost uh, for what they had, uh, what Nazis uh, had done. So it's a very complicated thing, but um, it was a delicate balance, I would think, to the, to uh, show what the Japanese had done and, and still not make us all prejudiced against anybody from Japan. I wonder how you struggled with that. Yes, <clears throat> I, I was trying to, I was trying to follow Florence's journey of faith as I began researching the book. 
now she spent 10 years at Union Church Hall from the age of seven to 17. Uh, there was a substantial, if not imposition of faith, there was a requirement of participation in religious activities at the school. But I did not find in Florence's letters any references to her particular faith or, or commitment to uh, Jesus Christ as her savior. Um, she was very angry toward the Japanese by the end of the war. Uh, and that anger began with the death of her husband and her learning about it. And then what she witnessed on the streets of Manila and how uh, the Philippine people were being treated by many of the Japanese. Um, and then of course she was tortured by the Kempetai um, and imprisoned and not anticipating that she would ever leave the prison before she was rescued. I believe that her, her forgiveness of the Japanese came as she embraced her faith at First Presbyterian Church. I'm not aware of her references or referencing her faith until after she became a member of First Pres. And I know in one of her interviews with, with her son, Bobby, she made reference to the fact that when she was asked by a young boy who was brought to her at, at a time, I believe in 2008, where she didn't think she was going to live. She had been diagnosed, she was in a hospice. Right, I remember. And um, someone from the church uh, had arranged for a boy and his father to come and see her as an exemplar of what faith could produce in a, in a person. And she made a brief reference at that time to her really finding her faith uh, after the war. So I'm, I'm not sure when it occurred, but maybe somebody up here on the Zoom panel is responsible. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or, or, or questions? We're, we're nearing the uh, noon hour, which we uh, usually end by then, but any other comments, questions? I, I, I have a I have a question that deals with a kind of a side issue in the book, uh, not about Florence, but about uh, MacArthur. Um, you, you tell very clearly how um, MacArthur um, ig ignored uh, the um, movement of the Japanese. Have you any explanation for, for what he did? I tried very hard to be fair to General MacArthur. Uh, <coughs> you know, there are many historians who have written about him. Uh, William Manchester wrote a very laudatory biography of General MacArthur. There are others who feel that uh, he was uh, uh, so full of himself, so arrogant, so uh, unrelenting in his belief in himself, as opposed to being able to get contributions from others, uh, that he was surrounded by a palace guard of yes people, yes men in that case. Yes. Um, uh, my, 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 my feeling is that MacArthur was a brilliant general. Um, his 
uh, Incheon landings in the Korean War were are absolutely spectacular. They led to another failure based upon his attitudes that the Chinese would not come into the, would not cross the Yalu River in during the Korean War that led to his being relieved. But his invasion of New Guinea, he, he was, he was, He, 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 there were there were instances of him showing great leadership as a general. At the same time, he failed in the Philippines. He failed on the first day of the invasion of the Philippines when the Japanese invasion fleet was still up there at Formosa for the most part. And he had a whole Far East Pacific Air Force led by 36 B-17s that should have been unleashed on that invasion force, could have been unleashed, and he held back from allowing them to attack. Why? No one knows. And MacArthur being the kind of man who could never admit a mistake, maybe you know somebody like that in a high leadership position right now in the United States of America, uh, uh, he failed and and the Philippines was in part lost. It may never, it might not have been possible for them long-term to be held anyway, because there was no way quickly back to support the Philippines. But he was a man of great gifts and a man of great weaknesses. And sometimes the gifts, uh, uh, were able to be utilized effectively and at times the weaknesses took over. He was a fascinating man, to say the least. And uh, as driven and ambitious as anyone we've ever produced in this country. I can remember his speech in the joint uh, House and Senate when he says, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think we'll, we'll take uh, one more question um, and then uh, we'll ask uh, Carrie Ann to give a closing prayer. I have can a question. I, can I make a comment about Florence? When sure. I, well, I <clears throat> visited her in the nursing home when she was flat on her back and uh, we had a lovely discussion, but she said, I can't do anything, but I can pray for people. And I thought, boy, oh boy, that kind of faith is so important. Wow. Uh, Lucia, did you have a question? Yes, I had a question and um, it may be a subjective one. Um, is there any recognition of Florence and her role in the Philippines today? And has the position of Bellatas gotten any better? Uh, the position of whom? The Mulatas. Oh, the Mestizas? Mestizas. Sorry, I got oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I understand. I want. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I I think the book that Betty and Bobby gave me permission to write is, for better or worse, the best uh, example of recognition that Florence could have received. Maybe somebody else could have written a better book than me, but this book at this particular time is a testament to who she was, what she accomplished, all the lives she affected both before the war, during the war, and after the war, and right up until her passing at the age of 101. So she, she, you know, she got the Medal of Honor uh, if you've read it, I was going to at one point thinking about reading the citation of the Medal of Honor because it really is so extraordinary. Uh, I won't do that at, at right now, but um, of course the Coast Guard in 1995, 50 years after the war, called her the greatest of all of the female heroes in the spars of, of the Coast Guard. And so uh, she finally got her due, if that's the right terminology, but it didn't matter to her. I don't think it mattered to her, any of the recognitions. She loved life. 
She loved people. She loved helping people. She was always looking forward. And so I'm, I'm glad for those who, who live in a time like these, like this one, um, to read a book like this about a person like Florence and appreciate what humility is and what genuine greatness in an individual is. And we need more stories like Florence's. And there may be many more unsung heroines like her. And I hope, I hope they'll be written about too. I, I, think, I think what Lucia might have been asking was, uh, those of us in the United States uh, can read the book and, and understand more about this. I think she was also wanting to know um, whether she's, how she's viewed in the Philippines. And I think she also wanted to know, um, has there been a change in the way the Matisse's people uh, those with uh, Philippine and American parents are treated. Has that changed and improved? I think that's what Lucia also wanted to know. Thank you, Lorraine. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, today, um, there's absolutely no uh, racial bias against mestizos. There are, and they aren't even called mestizos. There are so many uh, mixed race people in the Philippines uh, that yeah. there's, there's, there's really no further uh, proliferation of the kind of attitudes of the British and American expatriates um, uh, that existed back then before the war. So uh, the other aspect is what recognition there is of Florence in the Philippines, and I don't really know. I know that <clears throat> the book has been uh, uh, selling in the Philippines. Uh, there may be a good readership for it. I hope there is, uh, but I don't know to what extent there is public recognition of Florence. One of the, the, the two of the people that she interacted with very closely were the Escotas and jo Josefa Escota, Mrs. Mrs. Escota, was uh, the woman who led uh, the effort during a plebiscite to allow women the right to vote in the Philippines in the 1930s. She led that. She is a great and honored individual in the Philippines. And she was part of Florence's network along with her husband, uh, Antonio. Um, so I, I, I think there, there ought to be some new recognition of Florence in the Philippines, but I'm not aware if there is right now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you so much um, again, Robert, for, for coming to talk with us today. And I know we um, will appreciate your time and, and, and you doing, doing this work to bring more of Florence's um, life to us. Um, I see people are sort of leaving the Zoom, so I know it is afternoon, after 12 noon. <laughs> so, uh, I think I will ask uh, Carrie Ann if she could close us in prayer. Go 42. Let us pray. Yeah, oh, holy God, you who are the author of all of our stories, we give you thanks for those of us who are captured by the stories of others, that we might be guided by every instance in which we see a reflection of your work, your courage, your strong and steadfast love. Remind us each that we live in history, the history books of tomorrow, and remind us to live in such a way that our own stories are worth telling, as was that forever of your son, Jesus Christ, who guides us, shows us humility, reminds us of our better selves, and teaches us always. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm.